start our recording. Um, and at this point, I can uh, really hand the floor over to Val Mott, who's going to talk about the, as you can see, the Brentford Flood of 1841. So Val, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I'm delighted to be here. It's rather nice because my book on the flood won the Lammas Prize the first time it was given. And it's now endlessly out of print, but it's a fantastic story and I've carried on adding to my research. So you have a, an updated version of the story today. I've got a fairly short time for a very big story actually. And what I've tried to do is to add to my slides facts and figures, so I don't have to necessarily state those for you. You can see them on screen. And I suspect your heads are full after a morning of talks anyway. I don't want to make this too overwhelming. The story I'm going to tell reveals a good deal about Brentford in 1841, sort of incidentally. Um, it reveals a great deal about human nature. There are real parallels with today about how people behaved during the disaster and afterwards. And it also shows a community surviving and recovering. To make sense of the place for you, I've chopped a piece out of the 25 inch Ordnance Survey map. Um, it's a little later than the 1841 flood and it has an intrusive railway line and the Brentford dock uh, which has appeared since then. But what you can see is that the town is very closely packed along a major road. This is the Roman road from London to Bath and it's the equivalent of the M4 in 1841. Um, the River Brent came down from the north in a huge series of meanders and there was quite a delta where it joined the Thames. The Thames is just bottom right, um, but it's been canalised, um, 1790s, early 1800s, and it's the canal and the old channels of the river that bear the brunt of the difficulties. The cause of the disaster is fundamentally to do with the weather. Bitter, bitter frozen December, and then the beginning of a thaw in the middle of January and the water unable to drain away because of the frozen ground. We have fantastic records from the horticultural garden at Chiswick. I was first told about the flood by Mary Pryor, who was working on a fantastic river-based and canal-based community in Oxford. And she kept finding reports in newspapers like Jackson's Oxford Journal about this disaster, which set me off looking for the narrative. Um, and this is where uh, my um, delight in the words of the past uh, comes into, into force, because I'm going to um, read to you some of the newspaper reporting, uh, simply because um, it, it is fantastic to have the contemporary account. So my apologies, I shall look down for a few minutes while I'm, I'm reading to you. The newspaper report appears on the 18th of January, a Monday, and Saturday night, Sunday morning, and the, the night. The journalist Sunday between 11 and 12 o'clock of the forenoon. On entering New Brentford, he found the town crowded by persons from all the neighbouring parts. The waters had by that time materially subsided, yet the high road was for some distance covered by large blocks of ice, some nearly a foot in thickness, which had been left behind by receding waters. The inhabitants of the houses on both sides of the road were busily employed with the town fire engine and portable pumps of every description, endeavouring to draw water from their houses. The water, it appears, was first observed to be slowly rising about half past 12 o'clock on Saturday night, but no fears of an inundation being entertained by persons residing near, they re retired to rest. Towards two o'clock, however, Police Constable Smith, T60, who was on duty near the bridge, observing the water still increasing and rushing with great force to the Thames, awakened some of the boatmen belonging to what are called monkey boats, large numbers of whom were moored off the differing wharves abutting the canal and cautioned them to be on the alert for their own security. A few minutes before four o'clock, a loud noise was heard to the north of the town, which momentarily approached nearer and nearer and it was soon ascertained that the narrow stream of the Brent had swelled into a mighty river, overflowing its banks and pouring itself into the already increased waters of the canal. 
The boats, barges and lighters were instantly torn from their moorings and driven with great force through the bridge towards the Thames. And the accumulated waters, having overflowed all the premises north of the high road, burst with frightful force through two avenues by the houses of Mr Brasher near the bridge and Mr Farrell opposite the church, filling the lower rooms. The police immediately sprang their rattles and lost no time in awakening the inhabitants. And here from that print is a little extract showing you one of the policemen with his top hat using the rat to go the shore, how that would work um, with the sound of the rushing water and the panicking people. In a very short time, all the occupants of houses near the marketplace condemned damming up their doors, and there is no doubt that the whole of Brentford would shortly have become underwater had the stream not found itself an outlet at the bottom of Church Alley, raising the walls of the extensive nursery grounds of Messrs Ronalds, by which means it joined the canal near its outlet to the Thames. At about five o'clock, the water was at its highest, and the only means of communication between the houses near the bridge was by boat. Towards six o'clock, the water was decreasing and daylight was anxiously looked for that the extent of the effects of the inundation might be ascertained. Below the bridge, that's on the, below the bridge a short distance to the right, were found five large barges driven by the force of the water against the wharf of Mr. Fowler at Brentford End, swamped, some lying over others. They belonged to Mr. Charles Saunders and were laden with 1,300 quarters of corn and 350 quarters of linseed. Near to the mouth of the outlet to the Thames was a scene of shipwreck, unparalleled so far inland and still to be seen. We created this map, it's more of a grey shaded area is the flow of the water. Basically, it's reverted to almost a prehistoric route, ignoring the meander, ignoring the canal channel, and it has flowed straight across a, a tannery, the church, a nursery, and through all the cottages down to the Thames. You will see that, uh, like many medieval towns, Brentford had a series of narrow alleys leading off the high street, most of which had an inn at the high street frontage and most of the plots in the town were very narrow plots in between because the street frontage is valuable and in this case because of the meander of the river the yards ran down to a lower level of the river where there were small docks. There are a number of phenomenal rescue bids and we have two heroes these are not their actual portraits but these are the men who are mentioned in the newspaper account Police Constable Smith T60, who was clearly the hero of the night because his beat included the canal and the bridge, which take, take, took the road of the canal. And I'm just going to read you another piece from the uh, reporter because it makes sense of what was happening. And um, Police Constable Smith gives him an account which he, he printed. About 20 minutes past 12 o'clock on Saturday, he first noticed the boatmen who were preparing for departure, remarking on the rising of the water. He rendered them assistance in more securely fastening their craft. Before one o'clock, however, the ice broke up with a loud noise. The boatmen became alarmed and some got out onto the towing path where they were immediately knee deep in water. About two o'clock, one woman being knocked by a block of ice into the canal, he jumped in and got her out. At two o'clock, the timber floats belonging to Messrs Dawson and Co, which were moored at the entrance of the River Brent, got loose. He got into Dawson's yard and acquainted the manager. He then went onto the bridge in the high road and watched the water gradually getting higher until a few minutes before four o'clock, the great body of water hurrying down the Brent forced into the canal, pouring over the locks without forcing them. The boats were forced onward to the bridge the first that sank was a coal barge, then one freighted with corn, another coal barge, and one of Bessel's passage boats freighted with hoop iron, from which he pulled up to the top of the bridge a child by means of his strap, and also a woman, I'm unsure with great difficulty. 
Immediately another of Bessel's boats ran against the corner of Mr Whitehorn's house, carrying it away, and as the boat passed under the bridge, Mr Plim the butcher threw a bullock rope to a woman on top of the cabin. She seized hold of it and was partially drawn up, but seeing her husband passing under the bridge without rescue, she let go of it with one hand. Fortunately, he, Smith, being at that moment sitting astride the parapet of the bridge, seized hold of her arm and she was saved. He absorbed 14 or 15 women and children on the lock bridge, so he went and accompanied them to the lock house, where admittance was refused them. He got them onto Brentford Bridge and took them to the station. And then he uh, describes the rescue of the heirs, uh, the, the Tolly family by the heirs. The heirs had a house at the bottom of Boar's Edge Yard, and as their boat sped past, um, they managed to rescue the children. The next morning, they discovered that the parents were safe in another house, which was clearly um, a, a very important moment. John Jones, a boy from uh, a Leicester monkey boat, coordinated the rescue of 21 men, men and women and children, and the journalist described him fastening a rope to a tree by means of which he helped others over the park wall into Zion House grounds. It gave way beneath them, but they fell into the grounds rather than into the water, and they were thrown safely onto dry land. And um, the newspaper makes a great point about how heartfelt their thanks was for for being rescued. The moment of resilience and strength comes when the vicar and the church wardens move. They'd already been reduced to begging during December because they were frozen into the canal. They'd been given permission to operate on Sundays, but they couldn't go anywhere. The parish had raised a special rate to help look after them, but it couldn't afford to raise another rate in January. So immediate care came from whatever they could get together. Uh, food, straw to sleep on, clothing. Um, the forthcoming author of a book about Brentford's history gave a hundred loaves and they took over basically an infant school where on the first morning there were 90 people from 60 households and the numbers decreased as the week went on but it was still very large numbers for a small town to manage. One of the critical things was finding funding. The Poor Law Guardians, Hazard, Granger and Leighton, visited 50 cottages. And Leighton was a coal merchant, so he was able to give them a hundred weight, one and a half hundred weight of coal each. And we find a report later that they got another 200 weight. Mr James Foster of Stourbridge, the High Sheriff of Worcester, and Mr Fryer of Blockswich, and other gentlemen connected with canal traffic are mentioned and the two largest local landowners make donations. The Times exceptional, offers exceptional praise for Stoddart, who actually had strenuously exerted himself, even though his vicarage was underwater. He left his grown up son and his wife to, to manage the house. I've been able to assemble names of all the people I could find on the north side of the high street, and where, it's, uh, where records survive, the payments they were given. Um, but uh, on the south side, there were fewer properties because um, the uh, parish church and the Ronald's Gardens were there and the, there was less dense building along the road. They're given relatively small sums, but even, for example, the six bells, which was taking people in that night, the liquor casks burst in the flood and they got £10 towards that. And the tanner, whose plot was on the curve of the, um, the old river north of the high street, estimated the damage at £1,000. The vicar and the church wardens were, were very upright in telling people about how they spent the money. And this handbill was issued on the 3rd of February, um, about 10 days after the disaster. Um, they had received over £700, and so far they had spent £483 um, on uh, helping people, and uh, particularly the boatmen. They also, later that month, published very detailed accounts offering information about the subscribers, local parishes, they, they put them in lists by parish, and they also described how they'd spent the money. Here's a little extract. Um, looking after the boatmen uh, towards their loss of property, to relief in the schoolroom, 
to cruise of barges towards their loss of property and then £154 for the families of Brentford. As usually happens with the disaster, the crowds arrived. They came from Richmond, Kingston, Hounslow, Uxbridge and Harrow, desirous of obtaining a sight of the damage. And the boatmen, who had had no work for ages, quickly moved into action and took them out on trips to see the wreckage. And then, of course, elegantly dressed ladies had been coming in their carriages to see the damage. And they were taken to the bottom of Boarshead Yard, where there was a small footbridge. And some of them rather mocked the canal boatmen who'd become a sight to see with their Midlands action, accents as they spoke. The newspaper reported on the 22nd that an artist was taking sketches of the scene to produce a lithograph. And here is the lithograph. There are copies in the Canal Museum and in the local studies library in Chiswick. The artist was E. Wildman of Stepney and he published his image on the 23rd of January. You can see the smashed barges, particularly Thames uh, lying on top of each other and you can for a walk over the footbridge. One of the biggest issues was how they were going to get the canal back into action and public meetings with uh, boat owners and cargo owners began to take place. They found great difficulty deciding who was in charge. They sent messengers to the city, they sent messengers to the canal company, and eventually they managed to get a, a canal company representative to come and coordinate the, the removal of the wreckage. And they arranged one early morning for everybody to arrive with ropes and hoists and the, the canal man didn't come. But eventually they did start to raise um, uh, all of the, um, the wreckage and the canal was reopened on the eight, uh, eight days afterwards after the disaster. Stoddart was outraged at the priority that the wealthy people gave to um, compensation for boat owners and cargo owners and made a powerful speech about that caring for people was the priority. So as the fundraising continued, the money for the poor was very carefully uh, kept separate from the money for the boat owners. These are the kind of boats that we were looking at. They're flimsy. They're not like the later 19th century canal boats with their metal cabins. These are under tarpaulins and they must have been a very chilly place to live. Um, these are some of the boats that were lost or damaged in the flood of that category, the monkey boats. Um, they are mainly from the Midlands. You can see they're near Birmingham or Worcestershire or Staffordshire. Um, the coals and peas in the cargo at the top, it's not peas that you eat, it's a very small grade of coal. Um, there's building materials as well. Um, and they think about 20 boats altogether were, were lost or damaged. The Thames barges with the uh, collapsible masts were below the bridge. It was hard for them to get through the bridge to the upper part of the canal. Um, but here we have um, quite a substantial number that disappear from the, uh, the registers of canals. Um, and you can see that some are wrecked, some still have cargoes on board, um, but only one barge from Charles Saunders, for example, was got up, was rescued. So we're dealing with very substantial boats. They're, they're 70, 80 feet long, the, the, the canal barges, and manoeuvring those was quite an issue. The other thing that had to be dealt with very sadly was deaths and injuries. Um, Charles Morris was the first one recorded. Another policeman described meeting him on a conversation with him, very intoxicated on Brentford Bridge. And uh, the, the, uh, the man asked Henslow to see him home. He could only go as far as his the end of his beat, which was halfway through the town to the half acre. And he was found the next morning in the brook, which was further east. He'd obviously struggled to get out, but he was too drunk to do it too drunk to do it, and he was buried on the 25th at St Lawrence's Church. William Fowler, who was the wharfinger beside the bridge where Mr Saunders' boats were stacked, had died on the Sunday evening. 
the inquest came to the conclusion that he actually was so ill he didn't really know what had happened and found the death not connected with the disaster. But poor Henry Corsell, a um, great deal of detail in the newspapers about Henry Corsell's injury, and he, somebody described him saying, he will save his barge or die with her. He's got broken bones in his jaw, his leg, um, his chest was badly wounded because he'd been hit by the tiller. But I've been unable to find any inquest or burial for him. William Spruce is the inquest that really provides us with the most detail. Um, he was found drowned near the wrecks. It was a very long inquest. When he was buried by uh, the vicar, he made a note that he'd been uh, drowned in the flood. And they visited the, um, pub, went to see his body in, in the pub, the Catherine Mill pub. The witnesses described the arch of the bridge dammed with timber floats and damaged boats. The canal company hadn't drawn the locks. And interestingly, by the 7th of February, there were council and solicitors, not only representing um, the timbers, uh, the, the canal company, but the owners of the timbers and Spruce's family, because they were looking for blame by this date. Mr. Golden, the Regent's Canal Company, was several times sent for at his home, but was very ill. And it's clear from the reports that he'd been up all night trying to manage the Regent's Canal Company uh, uh, dam. The jurors deliberated for 20 hours, and then 11 and a half hours, and decided that barge be driven against him and he'd suffocated and drowned. But they specifically stated upon their oaths that they felt it their duty to enforce upon the directors of the canal company in reconstructing the walls of the reservoir lately ruptured by ice and snow, such additional strength and an enforcement of strict watchfulness on the part of their servants that in future may prevent any future breach or overflow of the said waters of the reservoir, which in their opinion had not been sufficiently attended to. I found the minutes of the canal company in the National Archives. To begin with, then they're not bothered and then they start to be rattled. And then when people wrote to them, they were determined not to be blamed. And they said, the public investigation says it's not us. But within six months, they'd spent a lot of money on a reservoir cottage to monitor the, the dam and a waste weir, which the children had attempted to, uh, to uh, dine. £1,700 on a waste. Here is the only photograph we have of the dam. This is in 1880, where um, a hut has been built and a walkway across the top of the dam so that it could be properly managed in the future. It's holding back 125 acres. It's the, it's the reservoir we know as the Welsh Harp. And the dam would have been very visible across the open fields of Neeson. I just want to finish with a little postscript. Because this was not, it was very violent storm, surface water drainage, there was no canal then, but um, boats rode up and down to rescue people and the parish recorded that they had paid the watermen in bread, beer and brandy for saving the people. And then in 1903, a massive summer storm, um, described in this postcard by the local photographer as miniature horseshoe falls, that little weir across the middle is in fact the lock north of the bridge. So it, it was um, really a very substantial flow, but it didn't destroy the town. And just to um, seem to have lost a slide. Um, my last slide was going to be what happened in October 1987, when we had that massive storm that destroyed many trees. But in this particular case, the men at work at the dam managed to release water before because they would have actually caused very substantial flooding by preventing the siphons coming to action they actually rescued all the suburbs downstream so that's the end of my images and there's a lot of people that i needed to thank here um, but i just want to say that it is clear that resilience 
in the immediate aftermath and the beginning of recovery um, in terms of helping people back into action, it disappears from the press. There are a number of empty houses in the, the, the flow of the flood in the 1841 census, which was taken in June that year. But we know how long it takes for modern houses to recover from flooding that we've seen in the press in the last few years. And also, I think the ingenuity of the boatmen finding ways of making some money by taking people out there. And the reason that the boat owners were so frantic to get their boats up was because the greedy dredgemen from Lambeth had arrived with their underwater craneage system, and they were starting to remove the cargoes from the vessels in order to keep them for themselves. I'm very happy to answer questions if there are any, but that's the narrative as far as I can find it. And it sort of disappears um, from the press. There's more to be had, I'm sure. Thank you, Val. And Val, if I can ask you to start your video again, I did stop it for a little while, um, just to let you know we had a little bit of a gremlin on the line that oh, was no. just, in, just interfering with the odd bit of audio, but I turned your video off so that people could still hear you. And, uh, I, and that seemed to do the trick. So we have plenty, uh, plenty of, of audio from you. Thank you. Well done. Um, but I do have a couple of questions coming in. Audience, you can, as ever, just uh, thank Val in whichever way you are finding on your Zoom platform. You can either send a Q&A, you can send a chat message, please do so. But just whilst you do that, I've got a couple of questions that have come to me, Val, that I'll relay to you. Uh, one of them relates to um, the lost canal boat trade post-flood. Um, did this subsequently lead to shortages of fuel or supplies in the area, given the volumes that those boats must have taken? Um, it's almost impossible to tell quite what was happening. Um, Leighton's coal business continues very substantially, and he's really using the Thames. He owns a very substantial fleet of barges on the Thames, and he's bringing coal down from the northeast through the North Sea and in up the estuary. Um, the market continues, as far as I can see, and it was a major market for the region. Um, people came very large distances to um, attend the market, but I guess it may have been difficult to bring cattle and substantial amounts of grain in from the surrounding areas for the first few weeks because they were, they were dealing with a, such a mess in the town. And I don't really know whether the market uh, got going quickly, but it's certainly there. And the town is a very prosperous town. It's not just the market, but it has unusual industries. It's got um, very fashionable shops at the area where the flood was, as you could see from some of the people who were getting their, their compensation. It's a smart little town at the West End, but at the Eastern End, it's a massive brewery, it's distilleries, distilleries for turpentine as well as beer. Um, a lot of, uh, there's a huge wood yard. Um, it, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a t lost town. It's a bit like Stratford on the east of London. We've lost these cities uh, almost today. Whereas if they were in the northeast, they'd be disaster areas. And they're both areas that have lost everything in the 20th century and are now coming back with massive redevelopment. So I, I think the, um, I think the town survived because they had the road and the Thames, regardless of what happened with the canal. What I don't know is what happened to the canal companies in the Midlands. Mm. Sorry, okay. long, but they... no, not, not at all, thank you. And um, I'll just relay another question into you. Um, this, the question I'll just read it out is, um, today there are many charitable organisations that uh, join in flood relief activities. At that time, were the military or any charitable groups uh, able to be called upon to assist? Uh, there was a massive barracks at Hounslow, but I think really what was happening, because it had to be immediate, it was the parish, it was the local people who, who got together. And then the money raising um, it, it is something which the, the, the press clearly helped with substantially. Um, Later in the 19th century, there is a charity that is supporting um, the canal people. Um, and just off the butts, which is north of the marketplace and where the infant school was, um, they built a, 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 a sort of schoolroom and meeting place to look after 
the canal boatmen's uh, children and families. And the building still stands, it's a private house now, but that was the, the main support for um, families who could sometimes get stranded in bad weather. Mm. Good, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm just aware of our time. We're coming up to one o'clock. I'll pause our recording. And